Good morning. It is time for the Mike Hewitt Show, brought to you by RenegadeRiver.com. And now your host, Mike Hewitt. Hey, thank you very much, Brian Thomas. I, um, I'm looking around the studio, and we were all successfully paddled into the the uh, studio this morning. Jim Riley on shotgun. Ludwig von Wiedendorski is acting as the wall between Jim and I. The Trumpy, Trumpian wall. He is the Trumpian wall. To keep wall. us both on our correct I got, side. I got 10 foot higher. You get 10 <laughs> foot higher? Did we get, I'm, I'm not paying for it. I was I'll just going to say, I hope a foreign government is paying for this mess. There we okay? go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a, where's Pax at today? He is actually on his way to Fort Wayne, Indiana with my mom. Oh, well, good for him. Oh, boy, no better uh, visit than Fort Wayne, Indiana. Good, my good. golly. And, and in, in April, oh, man, Fort yeah. Wayne is beautiful this time. <laughs> People go to Florida, they're going to Fort Wayne. There we go. I don't blame them. It's, yeah. it's, you know, they're big choices. So. Their, their, new, uh, their new advertising slogan is affordable Fort Wayne. Yes. Listen, <laughs> speaking of education, <laughs> on the line with us today is Dave Deshaw. Dave Deshaw, welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me on today. Hey, listen, I, j just to let everyone know, both Muskegon and welcome back, Grand Rapids. This is our second week in Grand Rapids, and we're very excited about that. That's kind of your neck of the woods over there. Um, but listen, I, a couple things before we get too deep into this. Um, first off, you've been involved in politics for a little while. That's what I'm being told. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, I have been involved in politics for a while, uh, going all the way back to the early 1990s when I was a young man just... Uh, Getting out of high school, uh, I worked in uh, Lansing, uh, interning in uh, Representative Harold Voorhees' okay. office in Lansing, and been involved as a volunteer and uh, activist uh, ever since. In the last few years, been doing uh, a lot of software and uh, other related items to help uh, political and nonprofit organizations. So we're we're having fun, and yes, been involved for quite some time now. Very very nice. Now you you've been involved within the the GOP party structure, also correct. Yes, uh, previously served as the chairman of the uh, Kent County Republican Party and as the third district chairman, which is uh, Kent, uh, at the time was Kent, Ionia, and Barry counties. Right. Very, very nice. Okay, let, now, what what grabbed my attention and the reason I reached out to you, Dave, is you you recently sent out an email, and part of it, it part of it, what grabbed my eye is a couple of things. First off, the uh, I think it's a subtitle, if I can, is advisory guidance. Um, but the overall the overall push of this is about at least my interpretation is about the state of the Michigan education uh, system. Is that a fair statement to say? That's a fair statement. Yes. What the particular alert I sent out, um, and I'm happy to discuss that as much as you'd like, is more a symptom, uh, an outcome of the current state of education today. But uh, yes, that is exactly correct. Listen, has been we we talk a lot or often on this show about two things. Uh, the one of them is the state of education, and, and and in fact, I opine often about the cost of higher education, but that's for a different show. The other thing that we talk about is one of my personal beliefs, and that is that unless we save the American family, which I believe is in free fall, nothing else we do, including education, will make a difference. And what I mean to say when I say it that way is that, for instance, last year, when we had approaching 50% of the babies that were born were born to unwed mothers and not teen pregnancies, but mostly to women in their 20s and 30s without being married, and many of them without any intentions of being married. Those things, when I, when, I, when I set those numbers aside for a moment and I look to Jackson Prison as an example and start doing a survey of the in inmates there, the overwhelming majority, the majority of them came from single parent families. And how I'm dovetailing this together, just to help help you see where I'm coming from, is I believe that with each generation, our, our parents or parent, and in some cases grandparent instead of a parent, are becoming lesser and lesser equipped to be partners in education with the teachers. So regardless of what we think of public education, this to me is a two-pronged thing that both needs to work. The public education structure needs to work and the family unit needs to work. And, and if, to me, the foundation is the family unit, which as, as I said, is in free fall. Am I, am I off in the ditch on that, Dave? No, uh, you're not off in the ditch on that. I mean, the, the basic unit of government uh, in our society is the family structure. Uh, and when you're missing members of that government, you know, the, the United States Congress couldn't function without the, both the House and the Senate. And I know some days 
Uh, maybe we would prefer that. We prefer they don't function. But, but it, you know, you need those different viewpoints. You need those checks and balances. The design is there for a system to work. Same thing with the basic family unit. It is the basic unit of government. And when it breaks down, then everything else around it breaks down. And the education system, in my view, is really just a, a, you know, a symptom of the breakdown of the family unit. So it, it, I don't think you're in, in the ditch at all. It is. And for me, it comes to things, that, for instance, I'll give you a, a couple different directions on this topic that I'm trying to illustrate. The first is, is that... For instance, when I was a little boy and had challenges in one topic or another, I remember sitting with my mother at the kitchen table and going over the work, and she was quite handy at going over the work. And that is becoming more and more of a challenge for parents to actually engage in the work that our schools, even though you and I may not like the curriculum, they're advancing. That partnership between the mother or the father or some adult in the family structure helping, that's why I call them a partner with educators, is that that's, I think, how this, that's how it ought to be. The other thing is, is that we used to have, at least in my family, and I think a lot of families, we used to have, uh, you know, the classic father knows best 1950s gathered around the kitchen table or the, or the dining room table to have a meal, uh, or if we went out on an occasional trip to the restaurant because it wasn't back when I was a kid going to the restaurant was a treat but we went when we went there it was a family event and so you didn't have four people two children and two parents all chatting with somebody else somewhere else on a smartphone but rather you usually engaged in dialogue often that dialogue was about what the child was doing uh, in their life or it was about current events and in both of those applications the parent had a mechanism to share what that parent's mor moral uh, and, and ethical view was on the topics of our times. And we're not seeing that conversation happen a lot anymore, and I find that fearsome. No, we're not seeing that happen, and that, that is fearsome. And what, we're, what the, 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 the additional aspect of that is we're not, unfortunately, seeing a lot of children come out of the education system with the ability to think critically. Right. Um, you know, children do not just automatically adopt the viewpoint of their parents. They're certainly shaped by that. But at a minimum, they should be taught how to think and how to reason and how to ask questions. And that's not happening. No, you know, not. We're, we're not getting parents engaged, unfortunately. Um, and we're getting school systems that um, because of some of the nonsense, like what uh, the email I sent out, you know, it becomes adversarial rather than. Uh, a cooperation uh, relationship. It's an adversarial relationship. Sure. And we end up with fighting over these types of issues, unfortunately, rather than teaching our children how to think critically. And, and that is a problem. Well, you know, Thomas Sowell's got a, a fairly famous quote, uh, and I'll read it to you. Um, uh, the problem isn't that Johnny can't read. The problem isn't even that Johnny can't think. The problem is that Johnny doesn't know what thinking is. He confuses it with feeling. And this That's seems right. to me to be a significant issue in our schools in that they're not even teaching uh, learning thinking analyzing in the way that our generation uh, would would assume it is they have redefined those terms I, I agree with that Jim but let me <clears throat> let me inter interject something when it, it feels like at least in the political arena which is where I find myself immersed that it's very very easy to point at the school system and say you folks are off the rails but the reality of it is is that parents, citizens actually, citizens have the power to do something different with their school system and their government in, in general. And so I say that because I've been to a lot of school board meetings, and the only people that show up, unless there's some big drama that's going on in the media, the only people that show up are there to defend Sally or Johnny because they've done something wrong and they don't like the fact that the school has taken some kind of, uh, of act action against them. I say that because, and, and in fact, I don't remember which one of you, but one of you used the word about joining in or the term joining in. All of the Boy Scouts, Masons, all every organization, church, by the way, every organization you can think of right now is very challenged to get people to join in. And I and I think that's that's part part and parcel of what we're talking about because it goes to feeling. It goes it goes to our culture seems to be in pursuit of immediate gratification without any capacity to your point, Jim, of reason, or to see tomorrow. And I don't want to paint with a wide brush, by the way, everybody, because there are some brilliant, brilliant young people out there. Um, 
you know, Matt Wiedenhoff, you you work uh, in a, in a higher education atmosphere mm -hmm. as as a an adjunct professor. You must have some young people in your arena that are absolutely brilliant and that are not inside what we're describing this morning. There there are few though. Uh, the, I was hoping the, uh, for a, I was hoping for a pick me up here. <laughs> the, no, the sad part is being there is at, I, I teach a management class and I don't give a lot of direction because it's management. And that's what you need to learn is how to do direction on your own. So I give them the basic. We do a project. I want you to tell you're the new CEO of a company. They got problems. This is so you got staples. That's your company. Figure out what you're going to do to fix the problem. You're the new CEO. They don't have a clue what to do on site. They're like, "What do you mean? I'm the new CEO. I don't. I don't. They can't critically think beyond what I'm telling. If I have gave them every step, they'd be able to fulfill it. So, but they can't so, think outside the box. They're not. So when I thinkers. used to, when I used to manage large numbers of folks. I found that some, certainly not all, again, I don't want to paint with a wide brush, but I found that some folks, if I said I need you to do A, B, and C, they would do that absolutely magnificently, unless something along the course of doing those changed the circumstance, and they were unable to match up the new circumstance with the directions that were given yeah. without further without further direction. Yeah, I call those my arrow guys in hockey. You draw the play out with yep. an arrow, yep. and they can do the arrow perfect, but as soon as the play doesn't, breaks down at the end of the arrow, they're, they're a mess. So they go back to point A. Now, Dave, you, you've spent some time reading your bio. you spent some time on all the different, and I shouldn't say all the different, but several different educational platforms. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, if you might. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I spent some time when I was a child. I went to a Catholic school, a Christian school, um, public school, uh, was homeschooled. Then I attended uh, Grand Rapids at the time, Grand Rapids Junior College, and then eventually Grand Valley State University. So I've seen sort of the whole swath of the education system. And, you know, it is fair, Mike, to say that we don't want to paint everybody with a broad brush because there are brilliant students and there are really engaged parents. The problem is that right now what we have is a situation where we have a certain group of folks who are setting the agenda um, and parents are just so exhausted from getting through the day that we are not, unfortunately, all of us as engaged as we ought to be. And then things like this come along, uh, like the, the, the bathroom guidance and some of the other things, and we wonder what's happened uh, to our culture. The fact is we can fix it, though. As, as devastating as this is that, you know, we find ourselves here now 30, 40 years later uh, with a family breaking down and the education system breaking down. Uh, you know, I've seen all these different aspects, and I still have quite a bit of hope that within a generation we can turn it around as long as we're willing to identify that there's a problem. And as long as those of us that are now raising children, uh, my children, seven of them between the age of one and 14, are willing to engage and get our children to think critically and, and help them understand that, you know, they're partners in the community um, and that when they graduate, we want them to be able to be, able to be people who are giving back to society, giving back to the culture, and engaged, not removed from the culture, then I do think we can turn this around. But it's going to take, I think, the next generation coming up, acknowledging there's an issue, and then spending the next 20 to 30 years doing something to fix it. Dave, I got a question for you. As a parent, because I think right now, you have, like you said, you have young kids, and I do too. Mine are 11, 9, and 5. One of the first things I do when I go to the, meet the teachers at the start of school is I address the issue right off the bat that if there's an issue with my son or daughter, I want to know. And when I come in, it's my son or daughter's fault. It is not the teacher's fault right off the bat so they know. And if there's ever an issue with anything they're not getting in class, I want to know immediately so I can jump in and help. Do, 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 have you done that? Do you know people that do that, or is that pretty rare? Because the teacher yeah. seems like astonished that I'm willing to do that. Yeah, it, it's pretty rare. You know, I, I teach little, or I coach little league. I teach Sunday school. You know, we're very engaged in the community, and it's pretty rare to have that in any environment now. Uh, it's absolutely the right thing to do. It's absolutely the right way to handle it. I will tell you, as a little league coach, I'm astonished when a when a dad comes up to me and says. Or a mom comes up to me and says, "Hey, if you have a problem, I want to know about it." It right. just doesn't happen, uh, and so that's. But but again, that's why I'm saying this can be turned around because if people will wake up and realize there's a problem, as Mike has, has referenced at the opening of the show, if, if once we acknowledge there's an issue, if parents will, will engage and start to do something about it, I think we can turn things around. We've seen what happens when parents disengage. I think we have yet to see what happens when they reengage. But we can yet turn this around. Folks, do not do what you just said that just does not happen very often but but dave, if they would do that it would change dave I've, we've got to go to a break but can i hold you over for a little bit further into the next segment absolutely okay in the meantime folks do me a, do me a favor and let me remind you 
Abe Lincoln, the philosophy of classroom in one generation will be the philosophy in government in the next. Think about that, and we're going to be back in just a minute. You're listening to The Mike Hewitt Show. Renegade River, guns and ammo, and so much more. Old-fashioned service with surprisingly low prices. On M104 at the top of the new 231 bypass in Nutica. Or find us at renegaderiver.com. Because you deserve it. And we return to the Mike Hewitt Show. Brought to you by renegaderiver.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Brian. Just to get over, if you're just dialing in, folks, we've got Jim Riley riding shotgun, Ludwig von Wiedendorski as the wall between us in case we find disagreement. Of course, Brian Thomas is, is guiding us, and on the line with us is Dave DeShaw. When we went to break, I left everyone with the thought of Abe Lincoln's quote, the philosophy of a classroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. And I, and I often quote that. And, and the reason, first off, is that it's extraordinarily true. We've, we've got infinite proof over the last, since the quote was offered, that that has been true with each generation going forward. When I couple that with, A, what's going on in our school system currently, where they're going to have 99.7% of the children deal with, with an immeasurably low number of people that have some challenges uh, with their identities. I, I, these things are so backwards and upside down to me, coupled with... Almost half the babies born in America last year being born to unwed mothers. When I look down the tracks, if we think we've got problems right now, I'm telling you flat out I fear for our future unless we get a hold of ourselves. So you've you've said you've said a couple times now, Dave, that that there is a cure if a generation coming up does something. And and first off, before I let you go, I gotta tell you, I don't think we can wait for the next generation to get a hold of itself. I think we've got to grab ourselves quick by the bootstraps and get this program tied up tight. So help me out. Well, show me show yeah, me the light. Sure, sir. Sure. First of all, I agree with you that we can't wait. I'm not advising we wait. I, I'm advising we start engaging in that fight right now, as, as you, Mike, already have for the last few years. I'm in, advising we engage in that fight right now. I guess my point was simply, you know, you gave a, a, that great Abraham Lincoln quote. I'll give you a Ronald Reagan quote. He once said, no arsenal and no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. So when we look at what's going on, my argument is, if we have them, if we can find a small group of people with the moral courage and the will to see change affected, we can fix this. We can turn this around. By the way, that's how we got in the place we're in. You know, this started 40, 50 years ago with a small group of people dedicated to changing the way the American system worked. And we sort of stood back and it happened. Now there are those of us, and I think there's a generation coming up that has said, okay, we've seen the, 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 what we've reaped from that. We reject that as where we should go as a country, where we should go as a society, and we're going to stand up and do something about it. And now it's not even a theoretical exercise. There's real-world results. You're, right. you're reading some of those stats already. So where I have hope is that as we begin this fight again afresh with these stats, knowing that this has been the result of the last 50 years of these policies where government replaces family and where education is not first does not first start with the parents, but it's offloaded to others, as we see the results of that, I think that there's a generation of us coming up. I'm in my I'm in my 30s. I think there's a generation of us coming up now in our 20s and 30s who are saying, we don't want that. We've had enough. We're going to start fighting now to turn this around. And I believe it will take some time to turn it around. But I think there are those of us right now who are already saying, we can fix this. We're going to fix it. It doesn't matter what it takes. We have to We have to fix it. I, I hope you're right. I pray you're right. When I, when I look at the problem in total... I try to look at American history and say, when when did we leave the tracks? And in my view, uh, when, once upon a time, the United States had its education built built on the township education um, status or the town process. And I, when I say that, in fact, in fact, I'm 55 now, and my education was probably at the very, very, very end of that, where they started building massive complexes uh, in the in the uh, the 70s primarily and then forward from there before that I mean in fact you can still go to towns all over America and see what was what was once the high school is a community high school and not some big gigantic and the irony to it is is that we were sold that 
under the bill of goods that or the the suggestion that it was cheaper to do it this way than to have all of the small schools and i beg to differ the math first off does not justify what they're saying you take grand haven high school as an example where they've got 55 60 million dollars in this complex and i'm thinking you know you could have did a lot of township school systems or local municipal school systems for that same just brick and mortar cost and actually had an effective outcome because when we look back when we had township level uh, education it worked the community was far greater involved and the more government seems to say we've got this don't worry about it the less the citizenry seems to be worried and that's well, the problem folks th th that is a problem but i will say this you know you see the explosion of charter schools you see parents hungry to have their kids educated the right way i think there's a great silent majority if you will out there who are rejecting that notion. And, and if you look at the explosion of charter schools, if you look at the explosion of home schools, it's not, again, there are many wonderful teachers in our public school system. There are a lot of folks who do a great job. Uh, they're obviously fighting an uphill battle, but there are a lot of parents out there who are rejecting the notion that we should do it the way we've done it the last 40 years, and that it's time to go back. I, you know, uh, to, I, let me, origins. I'd like to just comment on it because I, I agree with you. As a matter of fact, that's the tremendous expansion in charter schools, private schools, and, and homeschooling. These are the parents that have the wherewithal and the will to affect change. The problem with that entire um, uh, concept is that those people who can make the change in our public schools instead of standing tall making change are in fact leaving the system in total and leaving it to the dregs to the parent the parents that don't have the wherewithal the knowledge the interest or what have you and it seems to me that uh, the, the the disgraced senator democrat john edwards who did talk about two americas this may very well what well, for sure is happening in the united states today as the parents who care, the parents who really uh, are in, involved and engaged, those people that you're talking about, are moving out of a system that clearly has failed, and they are then leaving a, a gigantic vacuum of anyone to affect change. Well, that's a fair point. Uh, however, those parents raising those children and teaching them to be engaged means we're going to have a generation coming up that recognizes that now I can plug back into that system and I can affect that change. So the first step is take them out, clean it up, and then they are plugged back in and they become teachers. They become educators. They, they send their children to public school. There isn't an automatic idea here, I think, that just because children are presently leaving the public school system that their children won't re-engage with the school system. I think they're, they're, you're going to see change not only from within the public school system, but you're going to see that generation that's been pulled out reinserted, helping bring that change into the public school system. That's what I believe. I, I think part of the problem to both of you is that, for, and for instance, I'm looking at a map now, and this map says half of the United States lives in these counties, and then there's some sparse counties. Of course, it's large on, out on the left coast, and large out on the Lost Coast, as I affectionately refer to the East Coast. Um, and, and then there's some sporadic counties here and there across the United States, but frankly, you can count them on your fingers off of the coasts. I say that because the remedies that the three of us might think of normally... Now, let me preface this by saying this. I honestly believe there's two Americas. Inner-city America is very, very different than the rest of America. And, and when I say it that way, I don't want anyone be, to be insulted. I'm just looking at the reality of it. If you take Detroit as an example, the educational results of what's going on in Detroit are on par with Haiti, literally. And it, it, so their problems are not the same problems we're wrestling with in Kent County or Ottawa or, or Muskegon County. It just isn't. And so when we're, when we're looking at it that way, I've often said, while I say if we don't save the American family, that saving the American family has got to start in inner-city America. It just does, where you've got children that are being raised by 70 and 80-year-old grandparents and no parents, and, and we've got an absolute third-world nation 
living within the within the confines of within the borders of America. Um, and unless we unless we have a long look in the mirror and a come to Jesus meeting and acknowledge that that's the truth, then I think we're flailing in the wind with all the rest of it because those two cultures affect each other, not always in a nice way. We have got to save along with the schools and the families inner city. It's, we, can't, we can't ignore it. And none of the cures we're talking about are going to get to that problem in my view. What say you, gentlemen? Well, well I, clearly, clearly there are challenges that exist in the city of Detroit and the city of Flint and, and other places that uh, you know are gargantuan in nature. But I will say, I look at even the Grand Rapids system, which I think uh, you know, has done a tremendous job of maintaining educational standards and and uh, educating children. I, I, look, the fact is, is you're not wrong about the idea that there are significant challenges and that they first have to be addressed by the family. But I do think this cuts across, uh, you know, all kinds of geographic and other demographic lines. I I think that this this problem exists ir- irregardless of what city or area you're in, and that the solution to it, parents of all shapes, sizes, and stripes, reengaging. Uh, with their children to teach them whether they're in a public or private or home school christian school doesn't matter i think that's the answer and i think we're seeing a generation even in the city of detroit and in flint and grand rapids say enough is enough to to your point there dave it, it, when you look at the math um re- regarding race or ethnicity in general or or geographic location you can take the map of the united states and and, and put a, an overlay that shows where where family is in most strife by percentage of divorce or single parenthood, and then lay over the top of that another another map that another map that lays over and show highest incarceration rates. It doesn't. There's no. There's no correlation between race or anything else. If those two numbers tie together, if family is in trouble, so is education. If family is in trouble, there's a higher incarceration rate. Uh, it, it's just, it's, to me, part of this is just math. It's not race. It's not anything. It's about the foundation that we're allowing our kids to stand on, or indeed not to be able to stand on. That's that's true. And throughout history, we've seen as a nation that when uh, leaders will stand up and speak the truth, that the free people of America uh, will follow, uh, and not follow blindly. But, but think this through and follow. And I think that there's a, a movement that is not yet getting attention in the, in the mainstream media of young families, especially young fathers, saying, enough is enough. We want to fix this. We need to change things. And I think as you get that happening, uh, you will see the family get fixed and you will see the education system get fixed. But it's going to, see, it's going to be a long time before we see the effects of it. Is the is the is the advisory guidance something you send out often? Is that yours or what is it? Uh, yeah, the, well, the reference to the advisory guidance was uh, uh, was the actual name of the uh, state board of education proposed policy. I see. Uh, I I will send out occasionally action alerts, uh, and I try to stay as engaged as I can. Well, you know, having a business and uh, raising seven children, but um, we will send out uh, email updates occasionally. The advisory guidance though, was the name of the state board of education proposed uh, rules. Listen, I only had four daughters, and it made me bald and everything else. <laughs> I, I look like an old piece of chewed-up beef jerky now. He's, he's not lying. <laughs> he's not lying. This is why it's radio, not television. <laughs> we tried television. They want to stop that. <laughs> oh, very, very cool. Did you do some homeschooling with your own children? Is that what I understand? Yeah, yeah. We um, uh, At present, we homeschool the oldest uh, four. Um, as I said, I come from a background with a very diverse, uh, you know, having been involved in public education and public university and whatnot. But we homeschool our four children at present. Um, uh, the four oldest are the only ones who are of school age. And then I have a sister-in-law who's involved in the public school system. Our next-door neighbor is an elementary teacher. We just have some wonderful folks who we work with on a regular basis or in the public school environment. But we have chosen at this time to to train our four children uh, through homeschool. Again, mostly because, not of even policies like this, but mostly because we want them to love to learn and we want them to think critically. Yeah. And uh, we feel like that's our responsibility to do that so that they can be re-engaged in the culture uh, as they get older to uh, to affect change. You know, I don't, I don't know that this, what I'm going to say is any different now than it was 100 years ago when I was in school, but I went to parochial school through most of elementary 
And then when I completed that little tour, if you will, I went back to or to public school. Um, and and I got to tell you, in fact, Matt and I were talking about that in my shop recently. For the first year of me going back to public school or to public school, it was a real challenge. I got myself in trouble because, candidly, I was two or three years, not months or not curriculum, two or three years ahead of what they were doing um, in in seventh and eighth grade, what they were literally talking about stuff I did in fifth grade. And I'm going to wake me up when this is over with. And so being the fairly, you know... um, creative mind that I am. Of course, I thought of all kind of things to entertain myself, but <laughs> my point is is that, that that's that's something we need to take a look at it, beyond the topic of family and, and the things that you've touched on, is to me the, the curriculum itself in public education is as politically correct and insane as is this bathroom drama that they're th- pushing down people's throat. Uh, it's nonsensical, and it goes to what Jim has talked about, and Matt and you. Uh, it doesn't provide critical thinking skills. It doesn't say, here are four or five building blocks. What can you build out of them? Instead, it says, here's what we want you to do. Memorize the test. Uh, if you pass it on Friday, we get more funding, and we don't really care if you understand it on Monday. That, to me, is so anti-teaching, and it's not teacher's fault. I'm not shooting at a teacher. It's the funding process. We got out of the education business and into the funding business. And shame on us for parents for allowing that to be, in my in my view. I, I asked my students this year, what was the number one question you asked between the age of one and five, maybe one and six? And they said, why? I said, at that point, you stopped asking it. When you get to college, you never even mention it. Right. I said, you just literally listen to what I tell you and think it's truth. Scary. I could tell you the moon's purple, and you'd be like, oh, it's purple. You would never ask me why. Ask the question why. If somebody tells yep. you something, why, why, why? Always understand the why. Dave Deshaw, is there a way that folks can find you to get to get a copy of your uh, of, of some of the notes that you send out? Uh, you know, I don't actually have a, a website. Um, I, I'm encouraging you to do that. You're in the technical field. I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I think what you're doing is really good. I read this piece and the information you collected. you got to find a way to share it with more people, my friend. Okay. I will take that to heart. Okay, and then somewhere when we get past the convention cycle, let's plan to get you back on because I'd love to get your view of it. Yeah, absolutely. You uh, bet. I have uh, I have some friends around the country, and we probably have some interesting stories we can share. I, I bet we do. Dave Deshaw, thank you very much for joining us. And, folks, we're going to go to a break, but when we come back, we're going to get right into the Enigma Report. This is the Mike Hewitt Show. Uh- Renegade River, guns and ammo, and so much more. Old-fashioned service with surprisingly low prices. On M104 at the top of the new 231 bypass in Nutica. Or find us at renegaderiver.com. Because you deserve it. And the Mike Hewitt Show is brought to you by renegaderiver.com. And we have arrived to what we've been waiting for since last week. It is the infamous Enigma Report with Mike Hewitt. Wow, I'm liking the music. You hear it? Yeah, I like it. I just stole a song from the a great man from north of the border. The, I, was, I just love these synthesizers. I like the bit. It was a big bass sound. Yeah. That fits. I'm telling you. All right, here we are. What, I don't know if I can do any better than, than the intro. Listen, the the enigma to me today, and I, I had there were so many enigmas this week that I couldn't I couldn't count. But the one that bothers me the most, so that's that's the one I, I kind of stopped at, is the concept that in America, um, being an entrepreneur, or being self employed, or growing up and becoming um, a Bill Gates, or that those things are not possible for the average person. And I hear that a lot. By by the way, on both sides of the aisle, in pop culture. That you you know you're you're stuck you can't you can't and I just I reject that and to me it's an enigma that we have a culture that wants to tell us we can't um, and I I just I passionately reject that um, I've certainly had some train wrecks in my life with business um, but uh, listen the, the 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 greatest successes are often the folks that have failed a minimal of three times. So it isn't, it isn't a question of was it a bad idea, are you the wrong person, or, or is it the government's fault? It's a question of learning as you go forward, of persevering, of, I can't, I can't do the quote anymore, but perseverance is when you, 
continue to work hard after you don't think you can work as hard anymore. You just keep going like the Ever Ready Bunny. It's working hard. Now, Matt, you are working on it. What's the organization name? Uh, National Roller Hockey League. What is that? What is National Roller Hockey League? Uh, the NRHL is a professional roller hockey league. Uh, we started last year, season one, and we're actually in the finals this weekend with season two. Uh, we started with four teams. We still have four this year. Part of it's about you know not growing too fast before it fails. And uh, so, is it trying to be like a national football league or yeah, a na- yeah. national uh, hockey league? Eventually, that's, that's the, the goal. That's the goal. But you it's know? you and a partner. Yeah, my good friend. So I two people. With. Yeah, two of us. And you're both really rich, and this is just something you're <laughs> messing with on the side. <laughs> We're definitely messing with it on the side, but <laughs> I, the rich part, I, I don't know what that is. I'm, I'm teasing a little bit, folks, because I, I know Matt's circumstance, but it's the same with Renegade River. It's the same with almost, it's the same with Sears and Roebuck in the 1800s. It's the same with almost, of course, yes, there are exceptions, but it's the same with almost every business that once upon a time was an idea. Mm-hmm. You, in part of the what really stops people from, from, Ex, from um, excelling or from being successful is they convince themselves that they cannot and therefore they don't. And the the reality of it is is that, you, you know, you can sit, a friend of mine and I, we used to say, okay, what business we want to do? <laughs> so it's like you're looking in the in the index section of the white pages and you're scanning. Folks, that's not the word. That's, <laughs> I can tell you, that ain't the right way to do it. Do something that you really believe in, that you can sell yourself on, that you can absolutely immerse yourself in. Something that you're willing to work on when you're really tired of working. Something that you got a a little extra in the tank once you're out of gas. You say, I'm not done yet. I can get there. Something that says, I've just got knocked flat on my behind. I just took it right in the chops really hard five times. Let's go get them. My wife hates that I'm an entrepreneur because I, I will walk, I will go get a job. If I got a job somewhere and somebody called me and said, hey, I got a business idea, I'd walk out that day. And and she's the opposite. She's the nine to five, grind it out. And, and I'm the, let's go for it. You know, no idea is a bad idea because I believe in opportunity and I want to create and show my kids that anything's possible. One of the things, though, that some people confuse when they say it's not possible is they'll come up with an idea. This is just my view, folks. Don't shoot at me. My view is that folks were, some folks, not everybody, some folks look at entrepreneurialism as a shortcut. If I go work to nine to five, I'm only going to make X number of dollars. But if I go do this, I'm going to get wealthier. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be whatever it is you're going to be. And the reality of it is, is that it's really hard work. So if, if you were to, if you were to look into my living room at night at 10 o'clock and you think, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on this show, I'm working on the shop, I'm still working, and it's a live and breathe thing. And it's part of the problem, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it today, to me it's part of the cultural problem, and I, and I assign it to classism, which I absolutely disdain classism. Um, well, hate the successful person. Well, yeah, that that's really, that's... You know, shame on that person for being successful. They only owe one hundred and sixty thousand dollars in student loans. They only work, they only work seventy five, eighty hours a week plus the work that they did when they weren't at work anymore. Um, so shame on them for being successful. Why am not? I, why am I not successful? I work fifteen hours a week. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's just not how life works, and it's not what entrepreneurialism means. It means you're taking an idea. A concept. In fact, I saw a definition once that says that an entrepreneur is someone that takes an idea that already exists and makes it better. Mm-hmm. Okay, whatever the, in your case, with the national, you're not the first one. Wait, what if we had a national league? So you look at other leagues and say, how can I apply that to what I love? Well, this actually, they did do something like this. It was called Roller Hockey International from 93 to 99. And it was all the way from Quebec to L.A. to Orlando. I mean, everywhere. Uh, and it didn't. It, it ended up not working. But those um, were those were big money, big, 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 big money. And yep. and th- the goal for us is eventually, that's where we're going to end up. But we also know that th- we have to grow and groom the sport more before we can get there. And the same as you would any other business, 
You can't just go and open up a building the size of Walmart next to Walmart and expect to compete with Walmart. You have to grow it. You have to start like your shop. And, and Renegade River is doing really well at the new location. I'm there. I'm trust me, I'm there every day, and there's people always in there. I never get to talk on the bike anymore. And it's growing. So all of a sudden, maybe there's a second one. Then the third. Next, you know, you're the next Cabela's. You never know. Oh, but I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we all hope not in terms of how they treat everything, but for your sake of opportunity and, and growth, I, I obviously would hope that's the case. But uh, when we started out doing this, knowing we had to start small to grow it to where we wanted to grow it, but we also knew there was going to be no money in it. We were going to lose a lot of money. I had that $160,000 in, in loans. I am sitting on a computer at 10.30, even at 1 o'clock in the morning, while the kids are in bed or my wife wants to watch a show. I'm like, just start it. And I'm sitting there working the whole time on updating social media or, or creating a new contract or a new franchise agreement. There is no time off when you're an entrepreneur. When you go to bed, things aren't getting done. So there's people driving on the road right now going, well, if it's so bad, why are you doing it? So why are you doing it? I love it. And I don't know. If you ask Mark Cuban, he'd tell you the same thing. And the answer would be just, we love it. I don't. I don't know. I I I, I think that it was probably that, and I mentioned Sears and Roebuck. Um, I, I I think when you really want something to work, um, what's that Johnny Carson said? It's easy to make a little money if you start out with a million, <laughs> but when you start out with nothing, you got you got to put you got to put some labor into it. You got to put some you into it, yeah. and that's one of the things. It's so easy to say. It's not possible because the government's too big. <laughs> I just don't believe that there's always been some obstacles. Whether whether it was not government, but it was 15 other items, there's always been obstacles that stood in the way. If anyone gets in, into history, and I love history, anyone that knows me, I love history. I'll sit around and read newspaper articles from Andrew Jackson's time. I don't like Andrew Jackson, by the way. I think I've, <laughs> think I've mentioned that one or two times on the air. But, I thought you were his biggest fan. <laughs> uh, not, not so much. But also, I read newspaper articles just from through history because you see how people were living at the time. Mm -hmm. And you see where the, some people failed and some people succeeded. And there's always been a grind in people that have succeeded. Rush Limbaugh once said, he's, don't worry about what you're good at. Worry about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people will 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 do that. Well, I took this aptitude test and it said I sh should be in electronics. Well, but that bores is silly. You want to be a painter? Go paint. Yeah. If what what really lights your fire, that you're willing to work and put your entire self into it, and that's what entrepreneurialism is. And one of the things that makes America exceptional, aside from the First Amendment. One of the things that makes America exceptional is that you have that ability to say, I'm going to do a National Road Hockey League and pour myself into it. I just got a text from my wife saying, don't act like I'm a horrible person. She's not. She supports me and everything. She just hates the fact that I'm not a 9-to-5-er. She's a great person. Listen, I, I, I know you. And I know that. I know you both, and I feel bad for her. I do, I'm too, just telling times. You. I do yeah. too. Because she knows what my earning potential would be if I went and got a regular job. And I won't, because there's so much more. I want to work at 10.30 a night to make the next thing happen. Let me just say this about it. You married up. Yep. Oh, yeah. I plead the fifth. It's too late. You <laughs> don't make no difference. Yep, you no, definitely She's married great. Up. She's great. You know what? And in fact, she's actually, as much as she doesn't like it, she's changing a bit. Her and my mom and sister have started, restarted a caramel apple business, caramel corn company, that me and my mom started in 06. Unfortunately, our two biggest customers were car dealerships and realtors, so that didn't work out very well. But they're starting that back up, and it's booming already. Yep. And she's like, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm finishing my degree, and... and Keep finishing your degree. Do everything the way you're doing. If the business takes off, it takes off. If it doesn't, you continue down your path. What what a lot of folks will do, though, um, is they won't have a plan. And you yeah. have to have a plan. A plan is the steps going forward. It's a vision about where you want to end up. If you don't have a vision for where you're going to end up... Thanks, Mike. Yeah, she just texts, thanks, Mike. Well, but I was telling the truth. <laughs> but if you don't have a vision from saying, this is where we're at, this is where we want to be, that's the very that that's one of the basic ingredients to actually know how it is you want to end up at the other end. And by the way, everyone defines success differently. You were joking about me growing Renegade River into being a big box store. I'm telling you, folks, I don't want to do that. I really like standing around drinking coffee, shooting a breeze with customers, 
Um, people joke when they walk in. It's like walking into a barber shop or a gun shop 40 years ago. Um, and and I like that atmosphere. That, to me, is not, I'm not getting rich at all, by the way. In fact, I don't really draw an income from it. Um, it's four years old. I'm having a field day with it. Um, but it's a lot of it's a lot of work. It's like you with your function. I'm doing my orders during the evening because during the day, to your point, I don't have time to sit around and do the orders. So you go, okay, when do you do the orders? <laughs> I do them when I'm supposed to be watching politics on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what I'm actually supposed to be doing, but those are the choices we make. And so the, our loved ones, and that's part of the problem, by the way, is communication. So with you, with your bride, and me and my world, you have to communicate on these things. That's the other thing that will stop successful people that could have been successful from not being because they'll get pulled off the path. But it's their own fault because they don't slow to navigation speed and spend some time communicating expectations. This is what I'm going to do. This is this is what the plan is. Show what the plan is. Sell your, your loved ones on it like you've sold yourself. And then be relentless. And don't blame nothing on the government. If you've messed up and it doesn't work, it ain't the government's fault. Real quick, I can tell you that I was sitting in a bank with a negative checking account after getting my butt spanked in a campaign. Nice. My buddy calls me, asks if I want to do this. I'm like, yes. Do it. Good. Find us on... Find, <laughs> was a big thunk. Find us on Twitter at Talk Mike Hewitt and on Facebook at forward slash The Mike Hewitt Show and, of course, on TheMikeHewittShow.com. Folks, thank you very, very much for tuning in. And uh, pl- I wish you folks could see Brian. He's got a little card. Where are we at now? 20 seconds. We're doing the countdown. That's what folks don't realize is this radio business is all about timing. Listen, folks, we'll see you next Wednesday at 9 a.m., Grand Rapids and Muskegon. Thank you all very, very much. Have a great week. We'll talk to you then.